In North America, only 1% of us travel regularly by bicycle. We make most of our daily trips by car. Of those who do cycle, most do so for recreation. They could cycle to work, school, or the grocery store, at least some of the time, but they don't. 71% of Americans would like to bicycle more than they do now. They list distance, weather, social acceptance, and the need to carry passengers and cargo as major obstacles. What consistently tops the list, though, is the perception of danger. They just don't feel safe in traffic. It's easy to find reasons not to cycle in North America. But wouldn't these same reasons hold true almost anywhere? So why is cycling so popular in some other parts of the world? What is it about North America that rules out cycling as a viable mode of travel? Spin me like I have already spoken, like a spoke holds its tension. Like it's together that the spokes are the invention of a wheel, that a wheel is only as round as its tension, that a wheel is a round invention. She gets on her bicycle, she gets on her bicycle, she gets on her bicycle, she rides. She gets on her bicycle, she gets on her bicycle, she gets on her bicycle, she rides. She rides. I think cycling cities are, are better cities because of the use of space. It's more human scale, people are more outside, people can interact more, you have less pollution, you have lower levels of energy use, you have more lively, lively areas in the city. Uh, it may also be a better city because people get more physical exercise and more better, better public health outcomes. In 2011, my hometown, Ottawa, won a silver rating as a bicycle-friendly community. That's a distinction achieved by only a few cities in the United States and Canada. Since the 1970s, Ottawa has been gradually earning a reputation as a very good place to ride a bike. For most of the year, at least. Ottawa Council really recognized the benefits of segregated bicycle lanes and how in every city they've been implemented, that we've seen significant increases in, in cycling activity. This last year, there's been upwards of uh, 3,000 cycle trips per day. I use the Laurier bike lane every day, so I go out of my way to take that route. We're doing a fantastic job on lots of levels, and I think Ottawa is a lot better than a lot of cities, but I think we've got a ways to go yet before Ottawa is the premier cycling city that it could be. Ottawa earned silver for bike friendliness because of its dedicated bike lanes, recommended bike routes, bike sharing, growing bike culture, and great recreational paths. But as good as Ottawa is, many are not convinced that it's good enough. I would say Ottawa, in terms of being a cycling city, I would rank it probably about a six or a seven. Try to get everywhere you need to go on a bike, and you'll notice how many times there are uh, disconnects in the bike lanes. Ottawa cyclists still have to deal with missing links, dangerous bridges and intersections, nerve-wracking thoroughfares, and busy streets where they can get doored, squeezed, or right-hooked and the proportion of the population that commutes by bicycle is still very low. We're at 3% in Ottawa right now, which is just pathetic. And I think we have to stop building more roads and focus on transportation that um, will get more people riding and faster. The chicken and egg question with uh, transportation and land use. Depending on how you invest in your transport system, the land use will follow. So if you have most people living out in the suburbs and driving a lot, you'll have a lot of demand for uh, driving infrastructure because that's what people have to do on a daily basis. So only if you change the land uses, the demand will change for funding for other transport, transport options as well. And often it's not bicycling alone, but it's also bicycling, public transport, and walking together. If you combine these green modes, you can cover many of your trips. Bicycles can go up to three, four kilometers to access the, the transit stop. Building around that stop and connecting it for people to get there on foot and by bicycle to take the, the new light rail you're building will be, will be key. First, you have to have the bicycle facilities, but then you also have to have a place to put the bicycles. And it can be that you have bike parking at 
transit stops, but also having bike parking in new homes and having bike parking at work. I work in a building where there's a fantastic bike cage down in the basement. There's a place to take a shower. Things that make it easy to commute on a bike. So the bike lanes and then the infrastructure in buildings, that's the mm. type of thing that makes the whole system work and where you have people want to get to work on a bike. We just did a study here in Washington, D.C., looking at uh, showers, uh, lockers, and bike parking at work, and those individuals who had these facilities at work were much more likely to, uh, to cycle to work. If a government truly wants to make transportation safer, faster, and cheaper for everyone, it would spend a lot less on expensive road building and maintenance aimed at motorized vehicles and a lot more on active modes like walking and cycling. In the United States, there's a long history of subsidizing roadways. So if you look at uh, all money spent on roadways and you're comparing it to the money collected via gas taxes, vehicle registration fees, tolls, etc., about 40% of that money comes from subsidies. So you have income taxes, property taxes, helping pay for roads because these fees collected from road users and tolls and taxes do not suffice to pay for all the roadways. Isn't it an obvious choice? Well, it is obvious to some people. cities are great for cycling, but some are spectacular. The gold standard is Copenhagen. The impression always is, well, it's, it's Western Europe and people cycled there, they have always cycled and they have not changed. And that's not the case, especially after the Second World War in the 50s, 1960s, cycling levels drop dramatically, even in places like the Netherlands or in, in Denmark, but definitely in, in Germany. And then these countries started turning around their policies away from car-oriented policies towards policies, especially in cities, that accommodate uh, the bicycle. If you drive to work alone, you're taking a lot of space uh, around you to drive, and you need even more space to store the car in the city for the entire day. And so then the question was, well, is the city for the car or is the city for the people? And many of these uh, cities that went towards bike promotion very early answered the question, well, the city is, is for people and we have to preserve the city, we have to limit the use of space for automobiles. This included taking travel lanes from cars away uh, to build bike facilities, reducing car travel speeds. The number of parking spots was reduced in, in cities. Driving got more difficult, but bicycling got easier. Restrict parking? Discourage driving? Isn't that an attack on cars? Roads are built for buses, cars, and trucks, not for people on bikes. Just the opposite. This is where we belong. This is part of our city. We are doing more for the city and keeping it clean and breathable and livable than they are when they have one person in a big, fat-ass car. That dialogue made it OK to make it personal against cyclists. And that's when we decided that changing the conversation became an urgent priority. Driving a car is just about as common for cyclists as it is the, the, the entire population. Underlying a basic premise behind the so-called war between drivers and cyclists, we're all the same people. You own a car? I do own a car. I, I do own a car. It just celebrated its 20th anniversary. We've been, as cyclists, guilty of perpetuating that myth uh, because we do feel threatened, because things haven't been done the way we would have done for the last 30 or 40 years. So I think there's still a perfectly natural sort of self-righteous indignation that still exists within the cycling community. But I think we're getting over it. We decided to sit down with CAA and begin to leverage our common insights. We wanted to focus on the commonality between cyclists and motorists, rather than the conflict for a change that so dominated the media landscape. We are all cyclists, we are all drivers, we all want choices, options, freedom to, to choose the quickest, most convenient way of getting around. Our common issues, road safety and congestion. The CAA has five million members, and a couple of years ago they polled them and they asked them, 
How many of you ride your bike on a regular basis? And 60% of their members, much a surprise to them, said, yeah, we ride bikes. And so that became a business imperative for them. This is an ally of ours at so many levels. And of course, they have driver training and education schools. And they're right beside us as well, with legislators advocating for a greater investment in bicycle education dollars. I would say for vehicle drivers just to realize that, that bicycles are vehicles and have the same rights and, and to know that they have the right to the lane if they need it because there's times where you just have to take the lane because it's not safe to stick to the one-hand side if the pavement's cracked or there's something in the way. It's share the road and that's what it has to be. Cars don't own this city. It's a walker's city, it's a bicyclist city, it's a combination of everything and that's the way it has to be. Successful cities I know of, they do not provide separate cycling facilities on all roadways. The elements of a really good cycling city are first having the infrastructure in place to be able to cycle from anywhere to anywhere within the city without cycling in streets with high car traffic volumes or high speed car traffic. Uh, that means along higher volume car volume roads and higher speed roads, you have to have separate facilities for cyclists. Copenhagen does that quite nicely with the cycle tracks, uh, which are separated from car traffic with a little curb and then again separated from the pedestrians with, with another curb. And within the neighborhoods where car traffic is slower and volumes are lower, bicyclists can share with cars on, on these streets. So providing these safe facilities throughout the city increases ridership among all groups. The next one is uh, training, training for bicyclists on how to, how to cycle, what the traffic laws are, and training motorists to watch out for cyclists and how they should um, behave towards cyclists. And then lastly, in the more the soft factors, I think the safety is there, the infrastructure is there, people will come. But there are many programs for children, like cycling training in schools, or programs for adults to cycle. These factors combined will make for a good, a good cycling city. Programs. And I think the other thing that's interesting about Copenhagen especially is that it's much more like a North American city. They have lots of car traffic. They have big streets that have got complex signals and intersections and markings, and, and they've got a lot of, of, uh, of bike traffic for sure. They've got transit, but they've got a lot of car trips. We can make that same choice. I don't think it's rocket science or that there's anything unique or extraordinary about what Copenhagen has done from a technical point of view, from a practical point of view. What, what's unique and what's exceptional is the political decision they've taken, the community decision they've taken to just do it. Copenhagen's track record is very compelling. So compelling that some political leaders in North America are adopting or adapting what they've seen. In 2007, Mayor Bloomberg announced Plan YC, and it highlighted uh, that the city's economic performance uh, depended on the, the mobility and livability of the city. And it specifically addressed cycling uh, as a key part of the city's economic development strategy. Mayor Emanuel of Chicago adopted the same uh, idea as Mayor Bloomberg, and he said that bike lanes were an integral part uh, of the city's uh, economic development strategy. He went so far as to say that he expected to build a superior bike lane uh, network. Uh, I know, right? Cycling in New York has evolved from a place you, where you were totally on your own, um, where things were fairly lawless, um, and very few bike lanes. If we wanted to continue to grow and thrive and accommodate an, a million more people by 2030, then we needed to do more to improve the efficiency of our transport system and do more to improve the livability uh, of the city. And that meant investing in 
uh, efficient bus transportation. It meant uh, investing in the public realm, making it easier for people to walk around. And it meant investing in uh, a strong cycling network. Just in the past four years, we've added about 250 miles of bike lanes. And uh, the bike path system, especially along the coastlines and parks, is really extensive and getting better. We've created an interconnected system, not just a handful of bike lanes. And that has made a huge difference. So you see a lot more bikes on the street, and uh, it's becoming more widely accepted. Yeah. Everywhere we've put these bike lanes in, we've seen safer streets, and we've seen that they're better for business. With more people biking and with more traffic calming improvements, uh, we've made the street much more attractive. In parts of Brooklyn, if you actually stop for a minute, somebody's going to chain a bike to you. So there is a tremendous hunger and need for more bike parking. Our typical cyclist uh, has, on, has undergone uh, a bit of a transformation. We had to kind of be lawless for a long time in order to survive and kind of get through the streets safely. Um, but at the same time, as more and more people are starting to cycle, uh, we actually have to kind of follow the rules now. We're working hard uh, to get the message out about safe cycling. Sometimes cyclists uh, don't do us any favors uh, by riding the wrong way. Uh, so we enlisted John Leguizamo, uh, an actor, to help us with the Don't Be a Jerk campaign. There's always been much stronger support than opposition for our bike lanes. Most of the lanes that we have installed have been supported by the local communities and requested by local communities. I do hope that you come to New York City soon and borrow, rent, you know, share a bike and get out there to see the streets of New York. It is the best way to get around and experience the city. When you're out on a bike in the city, you have freedom and you understand the dynamic between everybody here. When the Germans and Dutch and Danish and Norwegians travel, um, they're always thinking, let's ride a bike. I think it's a lovely way to show this beautiful city to the world. It's the only way to experience a city so big and different like this. And when I told my friends that I'm going to bike in New York, they said, you're crazy, you can't do that. I said, yes, I can. You get closer to people and the neighborhoods and everything. Most cities could be just as bike-friendly as New York, or even Copenhagen. So what's holding them back? Too few politicians, planners, and engineers take cycling seriously. But maybe that's because too few voters, that's us, see cycling as a real option for regular people. But aren't cyclists regular people? Why people use the word avid cyclist is like... It's such a hardcore word, and I personally don't really like to be associated with being a cyclist. I just ride a bike. I'm just the person who chooses the bike for some trips. I think on the one hand, there will always be people who identify as cyclists and want to be seen as cyclists, and they really identify with the mode of transport as their lifestyle choice. A larger group of the population will use bicycles, and they will use them because they are fast, because they are convenient, and they are a great way to get around. There's, there's going to be a lot of other people out there who want to ride bikes but are maybe never going to call themselves a cyclist, and that's okay. In fact, that's a great ally. A good example is my wife, who's, who's American, and I can't get her on a bike here in the US. And then when we go back to Germany, even in big cities like Berlin, she gets on a bike and she cycles around because there are facilities and she's sure the motorists will respect her. It's been shown that a bicycle lane alerts the motorists that there are bicycles here, and they also share part of the roadway. So the lanes and the paths have done a lot to make New York City a much better bicycling place. I think the key is that the individual rider has to have a confidence in their own riding. If you don't feel safe, you're not going to be safe in the city. Ah, yes, safe. They always say, I would bike 
but I don't want to be in traffic. I would bike, but I'm afraid of cars. I would bike, but I don't want to be out where I'm exposed to danger. By any objective measure, you can make the argument that cycling is safe. So, so what the heck is going on here? What's the disconnect in, in our perception? Why is it that when, when the British Medical Society comes out with a study that says that the inherent benefits of riding a bike outweigh the risks by 77 to 1, nonetheless, the biggest obstacle in most people's minds to riding their bike is safety. If you know to pay attention to the buses and the trucks, the road conditions, people turning and car doors opening, then you can have a good day riding around New York City. Every street that has a bike lane on it is 40% safer for all of the users. So we're not talking about just you know, making streets safer for cyclists. We're talking about making streets safer for everyone. So cycling is safe, but is it normal? I think in the past we've had this vision of what it is to be a cyclist and you have to wear spandex and lycra and put on special clothes and how we're going to get more people riding in North America is if they just feel like they're themselves and they don't need to do any of those things. In the summer I will just wear a summer dress and I will wear the heels that I plan to wear at work. I think North Americans have this fear of somehow getting sweaty and you know not being able to look good at work if they ride into work and I think uh, people just need to get over that and just wear their regular clothes, slow down a bit. This is the Ottawa Velo Vogue uh, first annual bike fashion show last year. Most of our models were actual cyclists who um, we're wearing beautiful clothing from local local stores and designers. We used upright uh, bikes, as you can see. North Americans are generally just riding the wrong kind of bike for bike commuting. And more than just the aesthetics, these bikes are just functional and well designed for city riding. The amount of people that come up to us, particularly women, that say how much they love our magazine because they can see themselves in the pages. And I think that's what's the most important thing for us is being able to reflect people in real life and how they ride bikes. That's the greatest inspiration. Though women and men cycle with equal frequency in the leading European cities, that hasn't been the case in North America, where the majority of regular riders are males. But that's changing, as cycling is increasingly perceived to be both safer and more normal. Women, seniors, and other underrepresented groups are now claiming their space on the road, too. To be more accurate, though, they are reclaiming some of the space they once occupied, and the liberty that goes with it. You know, I've always felt that, that cycling is um, a liberating aspect of my life and makes my life feel more free. Um, but it's really interesting to look back at the early years of cycling. For women in the past, late 1800s, they really had no way of, of traveling around without a man. All of a sudden, the bicycle allowed them the freedom to move around cities and the countryside on their own. My name is Amelia Bloomer. I endorse those long, baggy pantalooners that you see in the pages of history. I would wear them out on the town, but folks didn't like a gown, didn't wear a gown. So flattery isn't why they named them after me. But in pursuit of emancipation, in the face of a scandalized nation, I said, to be free, a woman needs mobility. She needs the use of her legs. Her legs, her legs, her political legs. By the late 1890s, a bicycle was something that was really comfortable for kids and elderly people to ride as well. So it enabled really all walks of life uh, to, to move around cities uh, freely with uh, you know, a comfortable form of, of transportation and a cheap form of transportation. But isn't it funny how the simplest fashion innovation can have important So I say to all the fashion traders and all the innovators, don't take for granted what you've got, and please don't stop going out on the limb, fighting to win the rights. Can't you just get on the bike? Because there's so many of us in here.
here right now. <laughs> I was biking through a predominantly, um, actually a, a public housing, it's called Potomac Gardens, and this little black girl goes, Mommy, 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 there's a black lady on the bike! <laughs> <laughs> and then I was like, I was like, what is her problem? Like, she was excited, you thought I was Michelle Obama. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay, so I know that she's seen cyclists come down the street before, but what I realized was I was the first one that looked like her. And so I go home later that night and I'm talking to my friends on Twitter. And we started using the hashtag Black Women Bike. We may not be here in numbers, we may not have a lot of numbers, but we do bike. And so we said, you know what? We should start a Facebook group. And so we were like, okay, well now that we have this Facebook group, what do we do? So we partnered with Bicycle Space, the local bike shop here, to do different programs and workshops for our members. And our first one was how to repair a bike. It seems so simple, but it was little things like how do you fix a flat? How do you make sure you have air in your tires? How do you lock your bike to a bike rack? But for a lot of people, those little questions become barriers to, 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 to touring, you know, to commuting around the city by bike. We want to get black women and girls on bikes for fun, health, wellness, and transportation. Whatever your reason for getting on a bike, just get your butt on a bike seat. Whether you're going to the end of the block or you're going to the other side of the country, just get on a bike. For children, biking was once a popular form of transportation and an important source of independence. These days, it's rare to see young kids riding to school or riding at all. It's a very troubling trend that fewer and fewer children uh, cycle. I think there are a couple of reasons. One of the reasons is that if you have increased car traffic, it gets more dangerous uh, to cycle. Also, parents are more fearful of kids uh, cycling to school. And then at the same time, parents may decide to drive their kids to school, adding to the safety problem for those who are still on the bicycle, sort of a vicious circle. Schools, at least in the U.S., have become larger and larger and are often sited outside of neighborhoods, so you cannot even cycle to the school because the distance is too far from your home. So this neighborhood is Hindenburg, and there's lots of cyclists who live here, so it means there's lots of parents cycling with their kids on a regular basis. We now have a crossing guard at Bayswater, and I would say for parents with young children, having a crossing guard at key intersections is something that really facilitates cycling. The more kids cycling together as a group, um, the better it is in terms of safety on the, on the road. Parents at the school did take initiative. Two years ago, they started a bike club. There are kids who uh, learn to ride a bike who might not otherwise have learned at home. It's not just teaching the kids, but also educating parents that it's, it's a smart form of transportation for kids, and it's something that you know, they really enjoy and love. For one Ottawa family, cycling is a way of life. They don't even own a car. It's one of those first order decisions if you're not gonna have a car at all. Then you start having all the, the ramifications of that means that you don't sign up yeah. your kids for things that are halfway across the city because you're never gonna be able to get there easily. Yeah. So then you start making all the choices that make living without a car easy. We've got a, a utility bike where we can jam it full of groceries for the week or a trailer that we can fill up. We've got bikes for the kids that really work for them and uh, we have excellent outer gear. Bushel? I think just Half. a bushel. I a bushel think that'd be enough. Is. Yeah. Maybe you can ask at the market how many uh, liters of apple applesauce that'll make. You know what? How about just one bushel of apples and a bunch of corn? Can we do more corn today? So we certainly have a lot of bikes, but they're the bikes that work for us now, and as soon as we're done with uh, a certain phase of bike, then we can sell it and move on to the next phase. Yeah, we figured that not having a car saves us maybe $10,000 a year of pre-tax income. So it's not like bikes are completely free, but they're a whole lot less than a car. And it doesn't take that much longer to do the actual trip, plus you're getting exercise and you're saving money. For people who need a car, though, we, you know, that, that's fine too. There's places where a car is a lot more useful. And occasionally we do rent one and do some errands. Most families with young children appreciate the convenience of owning a car, but that doesn't mean they need to drive everywhere. We do have a car, but we don't use our car all that often. We generally prefer to hop on our bikes because it's faster and it's more enjoyable. This is my winter bike. Um, for the first time ever, I invested in snow tires or studded tires. I rode probably 
I don't know, 60% of the time this winter. So even when it was 20 below, I was still riding. The biggest advantage is that it's fast, so fast and reliable. So I can, when I leave work, I can pick up my kids within about 15 minutes. And if I were to take the bus, it's usually about half an hour and uh, walking is 40 minutes. Driving would be, it would be pointless really because I can't afford to pay for parking downtown. Everyone benefits when people like Catherine leave their cars at home. More bicycles and pedestrians downtown means fewer cars and that means less congestion, less pollution, less noise and less money spent repairing potholes. That's why the City of Ottawa has been introducing measures to encourage active transportation. These decisions are never simple and not always popular, at least initially. Segregated bicycle lanes really increased cycling activity and we were missing uh, a link through our downtown area. We've got a lot of nice paths around the Ottawa River Parkway and, and, and the canal, but we don't have anything that goes into our central business district where we have 100,000 jobs. So in order to make this happen, we had to remove a lot of on-street parking from Laurier. Okay, we removed 122 on-street parking spaces. But what we did do, is we created 144 new spaces on the immediately adjacent side streets. Issues related to pickups, drop-offs, deliveries, people with mobility issues, as you saw coming into this building here right now. We've created five new loading zones. This is one of them. Also, the barriers directly in front of the doors. Condominium people don't like that. It's a barrier to the road. So we've gone back and we've removed them in front of the front doors. Laurier Avenue, before the bicycle lanes opened back in 2010, there were around 500 to 700 cycle trips per day. This last year, there's been upwards of uh, 3,000 cycle trips per day. Though removing on-street parking to make space for bike lanes has typically been resisted by business owners, more and more are embracing these changes and pushing for some of their own. This neighborhood here, West Wellington, Hindenburg neighborhood, is really trying to uh, reconfirm its brand as being pedestrian and bicycle friendly, in part in recognition of the fact that it already is a neighborhood that has a lot of cyclists and a lot of pedestrians. The true epiphany in the numbers was that almost 13% of the people who were coming to our street cycled. So the BIA saw it as a real opportunity to support that. They've put out a brochure that highlights the safest routes to get around this neighborhood. In a sense, I think that business people have to get their minds around the new paradigm. Bike access provides easier access for their customers. And the bottom line is that it's just better for business. If you have a bicycle you can only carry so much, you probably don't buy as much in one stop, but chances are you're going to visit that business much more often. I would compare it to the no, the no smoking in restaurants. They were going to lose all their customers. I think the same thing can be said for the, the car. I think that parking is something a little bit passe, making our community more bicycle and pedestrian friendly, and maybe even having more and better bus service is actually going to serve the businesses better. 8th and 9th Avenue, where we created the first protected bike parking lane, we saw uh, retail sales uh, soar by 50%. We saw that on Vanderbilt Avenue in Brooklyn, same thing, retail sales up 50%, twice that uh, of adjacent corridors. As people's attitudes and habits evolve, so does the way we design our cities. We just did a study on young adults, so 20 to 29 year olds, in the US, six Western European countries, and Japan. And what we find for them is over the last 20 years, they have become more multimodal. They may walk for some trips, they may drive for other trips, and they may cycle or use public transport yet for other trips. That's a very big change to the 20 to 29 year olds 30 or 40 years ago, because once they had a car, they used to drive. In 1983, Nearly half of American, young Americans had a driver's license. Today it's 29%. When people live within a mile of work, nearly 40% walk or bike in 2009. That's up from 25% in 1995. These are profound shifts in a very, very short period of time. And I think we are at the beginning of something that's going to be even more dramatic is if you take a look at mode share here in the U.S., bicycles represent 1.4% of mode share. In Holland, it's 25%. In the city of Copenhagen, it's something like 35%. We have a long way to go. And the only way we're going to get it 
is to ask. The more people who bike, uh, the better it becomes for the rest of us, the safer the streets become, the, the more laws that are enacted to protect cyclists. What your movement represents is essentially a reflection and a reinforcement of what I would call cityness, right? Density, proximity, uh, the integration of uses, the kind of neighborhoods we used to build in this country a hundred years ago. We are going back to the future. We're going back to the future in the way we design our communities. You may not think about your movement as really at the vanguard of that, but that's what you are. It's harder and harder to find an American city that is not prioritizing cycling. And I have to create the kind of city that attracts talent. Because we're all in competition for the young talent that's out there and the young families. And putting in bike lanes and trails is part of that attraction of talent. We're seeing it in Boston. Woo! We're seeing it in Philly. Woo! There are even signs in Atlanta. While more and more North American cities work to become better for cycling, and by doing so, better cities overall, leaders like Amsterdam and Copenhagen keep on raising the gold standard. The journey from Ottawa's silver to Copenhagen's gold will take time and a real commitment. But fewer and fewer people now question the goal. Our vision is building complete streets, infrastructures like this pathway here, and better access to transit, and that uh, obviously helps everyone, whether you're a car driver, a pedestrian, a cyclist, or someone using public transit. I want to say how proud I am of my council colleagues because in our first budget as a city, we actually put in a record amount of over $24 million in the cycling initiatives. Uh, we still have a long way to go, but I think you've seen in the last couple of years tremendous amount of progress. We've got more work to do, and we'll get the job done. She gets on her bicycle, she gets on and when we build infrastructure and a society based around where walking and biking and taking public transit is much easier and much more affordable and much more accessible and much more fun than riding a car, then we're going to have a fabulous place to live. I get this feeling on my two-wheel steed as I pick up speed. It feeds something free, this desire for autonomy, moving outside the dominant economy. Two wheels, not four. No gas, no oil, no war for this machine. All I need is air. Two pedals, a crank and a chain, two wheels and a frame. A revolution that keeps me arriving again and again. She gets on her bicycle, she gets on her bicycle, she gets on her bicycle, she rides. In a democracy without a voter wheel would collapse if it wasn't for the spokes. She gets on her bicycle, 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 she rides. She gets on her bicycle, she gets on her bicycle, she gets on her bicycle, she rides. 